Welcome everyone. It's great to see you all here this afternoon. We love a nice Food for Thought crowd. Thanks for coming. Uh, Food for Thought is our ongoing lecture series in the fall and the spring. It's supported by the MS Worthington Foundation and um, our AV is, is uh, as always provided by Novation Media. So we'd like to thank those two sponsors. Uh, if I could ask you to please silence your cell phones for the duration of the presentation. And then um, quick note, if you need a restroom, right around the corner. Um, yes, let me get to today's presentation, Eric Savetsky. Uh, Eric was, is an underwater photographer and videographer with a lifelong fascination of the sea. Uh, what started out as a childhood dream of fishing far offshore for large blue water fish has evolved into a passion for finding, swimming, and documenting the rarely seen beauty that lies below the surface of the open ocean. His goal is to share these amazing images uh, and these encounters with people in the hopes of inspiring a deeper appreciation for our natural world. He's worked on several projects, including National Geographic Channel, Rick Rosenthal production, Superfish, Bluefin Tuna, and the BBC's Atlantic Wildest Ocean on Earth. So, without further ado, please help me welcome Eric Savetsky. Th thanks, Jacob. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, it's wonderful to be here in the Whaling Museum. Uh, great history and, and great relationship to what we're going to talk about today. Um, uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, the humpback whale. I'm going to go over the life history of humpback whales uh, and then sort of its two uh, modes, the, its summer mode and then its winter mode. Um, and so that's, that's, the, uh, that's what we'll be covering. The name humpback whale is derived from the arching of its back when it dives. That, that humped shape is how it got its common name. A uh, humpback whale. Its taxonomic or Latin name, Megaptera nova angliae, is ironically Mega Terra, giant winged New Englander. So really <laughs> appropriate that uh, it's it's named for probably because uh, the early scientists in Europe uh, were able to see these whales over here off of uh, Cape Cod and uh, Maine. Uh, early on and uh, gave it that name, New Englander. So it's something I never knew until I started to study the humpback whale, that it's uh, uh, close close to home in its name. And here you can see its giant wings, the two pectoral fins, um, which are said to be the longest appendages in the animal kingdom. Uh, they're up to close to two-thirds of the length, body length of a humpback whale, so they can be 20 feet, 15 to 20 feet long. And another interesting thing is that if you look at this marvelous sperm whale skeleton here and you look at the small pectoral fins of the sperm whale, they've got fingers, uh, which so inside, inside of those pectoral fins are bone structure of, of, uh, of, fing of a hand. Uh, here's uh, an additional shot of the pectoral, fi uh, pectoral fin. Uh, humpback whale on its back, um, fin up in the air, just doing what humpback whales do. They're, they're playful, if you want to call it that, or, and uh, I don't know if they fully understand why it does these things, but it does it because it can, uh, and it looks like fun. The humpback whale is uh, in the baleen or uh, in the rorical whale family. Um, the baleen whale is in a family, the humpback whale is, uh, it consists of the baleen family consists of the blue whale, fin whale, pronounced brutus whale, funny pronunciation, say whale, and the minke whale. Um, the humpback as well as the fin whale and the minke whale are all pretty common around here. Um, we don't have as many, but they do exist around here, blue whales, brutus whale, and say whales, but commonly seen here. We can, uh, right now, off of Chatham, there are numerous fin whales and minke whales. Uh, I don't know that there are any humpbacks left. They probably have headed south. There may still be some around. This is a shot of a blue whale, uh, much longer, slen more slender. Um, I shot this in Sri Lanka last year. 
Um, they're they're fast moving whales uh, and and hard to hard to document. There's a uh, person I was with, Tony Wu, who was uh, faster than me, so he's out in front of me uh, getting the shot. And then this is uh, just a little bit of footage of a fin whale showing you the, and there's a fin whale is more similar to a blue whale and it's a long slender whale and, and fast moving. Are, are a little slower moving, um, a little wider, stouter body. Um, humpback whales range in size from 40 to 50 feet long, with the females being slightly larger, um, and actually can weigh up to 80,000 uh, pounds at the upper end of uh, their size range. This uh, graphic shows their distribution. They're, they're um, worldwide distribution. Uh, all the blue spots are are their sort of summer summer habit or their winter sorry their winter habitat along the equator, uh, and then they might migrate up, and we'll talk about that a little later. Or down here, they're not showing that on this particular plant, but you see basically around the world, uh, humpback whales are, are um, distributed and can be found. Uh, the, the humpback whale is a part of the uh, baleen whale family, and baleen is this filter feeding system, which I'll show you some pictures of, uh, and it's made of keratin, which is like fingernails. Um, so in this picture, uh, the baleen is this material here, which are like boards actually all stacked against each other, acting as a filter system, and I'll show you that in a minute. But this is the baleen here. This is the, the roof of the mouth or the top. And then this is the lower jaw right here. And again, this is the, the baleen. You can see some water coming out of it, a acting as a screen to sieve out the water and leave the food inside. And you can see this lower jaw acting like a bucket full of water and hopefully fish. Another shot of the, the, the baleen and a whale coming up after uh, trying to capture some food. This is a good shot of uh, a lot of water coming out through the uh, baleen filtering system here and here. Another distinguishing characteristic of humpback whales are what is called a tubercle, and they are these little nodules on the whale here, here on the roof of the mouth, which are actually hair follicles, which may aid in their sensory perception abilities. Just another shot uh, highlighting the, uh, these tubercles. And this is a feeding whale. The, the, the gulls are getting into the action, trying to take advantage of uh, the, the bait that the whale has driven up. Part of the bigger family of baleen whales is the rorqual whales, and um, from what I was able to find out, the rorqual term, best I could find was that it was related to, uh, the word related to furrows, which um, you can see here, these grooves in its, this is its chin, and uh, as it's capturing prey, its lower jaw and this chin expand tremendously to capture a huge amount of water. I mean, thousands and thousands of gallons in the hopes of capturing a lot of small prey at the same time, and then using that baleen to get rid of the water and retain the, the food that it's caught. Uh, and, and its muscles are able to contract this whole area back and have it, be, when it's swimming, this is much more sleek. Uh, whales. Well, 
nostrils uh, obviously br breathe through their blowhole, um, which is similar to our nostrils. Really interesting fact that baleen whales have two nostrils and then all the toothed whales only have one. Um, Tony Wu, who lectured here on sperm whales, uh, pointed out that uh, very oddly on a sperm whale it has a single blowhole and it is not in the center of the nose of the whale. It's offset on one side and the other nostril evolved into part of its sonar system as a deep water whale. Um, so when you see a dolphin and porpoise, they have that single blowhole because they're a toothed whale. The baleen whales have two nostrils or blowholes. Here you can clearly see the um, here and here the blowholes and actually some fish trying to escape here. Just another shot of the uh, different angle of looking at the clearly defined breathing apparatus. Um, another defining characteristic of humpback whales is their tail fluke, which acts as a, a thumbprint. Every humpback whale has a unique pattern on the underside or the ventral side of its um, tail fluke, and scientists use them uh, to, to record their presence and distinguish one whale from another, and they track them over the years through their, uh, the print on their, so you're looking at the, the underside of the tail, and you can see in this one, it's a very dark pattern with a little bit of light as compared to, here's one that's almost entirely white, and these are both New England, Cape Cod, humpback whales. The uh, uh, Cape Cod, or the Provincetown Center for Coastal Studies, uh, has a catalog of a thousand different individual whales, photographs of the tails of a, uh, roughly a thousand whales now uh, that they've been studying over the years in the Gulf of Maine, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, and it's a lot, lot of work, and, and this makes it easy to track and, and understand the, which whales are coming back, which ones are having calves, what their success rate is, their longevity, and these kind of things. Um, another amazing part of humpback whale um, life history is, is this singing. Um, it's the males that uh, sing. Their songs can be anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes long. Um, they don't have vocal cords, so they're forcing air through their nasal passages to create these sounds, which we're going to hear in a minute. Um, they're Humpback whales exist in distinct populations around the world. They don't mix, as far as we know. They, uh, there's a, a Atlantic, northern Atlantic population. There's different regions in the Pacific, all with distinct populations. They all have their own whale song, um, and all the whale, all the male whales in that population sing the same song, uh, amazingly. And um, and that song evolves over time, uh, which it's, and they don't even understand the. They can't definitively figure out what its purpose is, but from observing the whales, it seems like it's uh, males interacting, um, trying to display some dominance or to, uh, really hard, to, there's a lot of different theories, but uh, a frequent observation is a male will be singing and it'll draw in another male and there'll be a, not a confrontation, but a disturbance and, and things will happen. And that's... So it's some, something to do with interaction between the male whales. Okay, now I'm going to just play a little. Uh, this is this is actually what and and the, these male whales that are singing are in in for people who either whale watch in the water or study them called singers. Uh, so this is a photograph of a male humpback whale, termed a singer because he's still laying there in the water, nose down, uh, and he's singing.
pretty ama pretty amazing to be there and listen listen to that and uh, there's all sorts of other sounds too. Um, apologize for the the movement. It's really hard. underwater videography is really challenging. The the most difficult thing other than getting there and and finding the animals is holding that camera steady when you're in water moving around. Uh, makes for uh, for the video part of underwater shooting really challenging. Um, before we get into the uh, the humpback summer season, um, just to touch on on the history of humpbacks uh, and their population, they were heavily hunted in the 18 and 1900s. Uh, they thought the original population was somewhere around 125,000 worldwide, uh, and that was reduced by close to 90 percent. They were they were nearly exterminated during whaling. Uh, times uh, until about 1966, when there was a moratorium placed on whaling, and uh, and they've done they've re been recovering really well. Um, they think the population now is about 80,000 worldwide, and uh, but there's they still face a lot of challenges with uh, entanglement with fishing gear, um, ship strikes, and uh, uh, ocean noise is a huge factor. All the different activity going on in the oceans is. Um, disruptive to the whale um, life cycle, and so there's an ever-increasing amount of uh, noise pollution in the ocean. All right, we're going to uh, transition into the humpback whale summer season. Um, they, as I said earlier, they, they will spend their um, winters in warmer latitudes, but then move up to uh, either up or down to the more of the uh, polar regions in order to feed for the summer. They basically feed all summer and then fast in the winter. Um, so they migrate all the way to uh, up into here from down in the Caribbean, say up to New England or down to Antarctica if they're in the southern hemisphere, um, making some of the longest migrations in the uh, mammal um, kingdom, somewhere as a round trip of, of up to 16,000 miles in a given year. And this is uh, this. Just to give you a sense of the uh, the regions it inhabits in the in the in its winter, it's in either the tropics in here in pink or the subtropics, which include from the dash line here, in between. So in this zone here uh, is where these humpback whales would spend their winter, and when summer season signals them, they either head up to uh, higher latitudes here or down towards um, Antarctica here. And this is going back to that distribution map. Um, and so the blue is kind of their uh, wintering months, but then you can see for our, our whales here in New England, um, this migration path here is actually to the Gulf of Maine, Chatham, Nantucket area. Some are up in um, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and some are Iceland, all the way up to Scandinavia up here. Um, same over on the west coast, whales down off of the Baja, Sea of Cortez off Mexico and up up in the Alaska area. And the reason they do this is to go to these cooler waters which are much more nutrient rich and um, there's a lot of food there for them. I'll focus a little bit on, on our local waters and, uh, and why things happen here the way they do. Um, one of the primary reasons is the Gulf Stream. Uh, we are here, Nantucket, uh, North Carolina, Cape Hatteras, Florida. The Gulf Stream is a giant conveyor belt circulating around the Atlantic, um, and but it's it's heading east as it passes by us. It's about 250 miles south of Nantucket. Um, so uh, we're in a really unique place where, as I I after living here for 20 years, come to understand that that we're really on the corner where we have two different oceans practically. The Gulf of Maine here you can see is blue and green in temperature. Uh, colder, colder. this represents warmer water, the red, cooler water. So the Gulf of Maine never warms up to the extent that to the south of Nantucket. So from Nantucket, if we go south, we're in warm water. If we go east, we're in a whole different cooler water, which is different fish, different mammals, uh, it really, really quite different oceans. Um, one of the factors that keeps this cool is the Labrador current coming down from, from the north. And this is just a little closer look at, at uh, the Gulf of Maine here, Nantucket, Nantucket Shoals, famed George's Banks. And uh, just briefly, this is the edge of the continental shelf here. 
Uh, at its closest point, Nantucket, it's about 75 miles south to get to the edge of the continental shelf. Uh, you know, it might be you're at the beach here, and it gradually gets deeper until about 600 feet here, and then from here to here, it drops 6,000 feet. Um, during the ice ages, uh, that was actually sea level right here, and these what we call canyons were carved out by water melting and running off of the edge of the continental shelf. Now it's all underwater and sea level 600 feet higher, but uh, back during the Ice Age, these uh, canyons were created, which are quite productive places for other types of uh, fish and, and marine mammals. Um, but primarily the humpbacks in our area come up into the Gulf of Maine here. Um, the closest reliable populations that we can easily see are here off of Chatham. It's very active, always easy to see whales there, humpback whales there in the summer, uh, and quite a few of them. They're here to feed all summer long, and this is one erupting out of the, under, for coming up to the surface. It's got its prey trapped at the surface. The, the prey can't go any further. It's got to the surface and the whale has opened up its, these jaw bones here, flexing out, um, that chin extending down here, and it's engulfing a huge amount of water. This is all fish escaping from the, and it's flying in the air here, some lucky ones, and the rest are going down, down, down. Uh, humpback whales can eat, eat up to 3,000 pounds in a single day every day, all summer long. Uh, they exist on, on krill, small shrimp-like cr creatures, copepods, and small fish such as sand lance, which are pictured here. These are about uh, three to seven inches long. Um, some mackerel, herring, but, but no big fish, all small stuff in, uh, that, that exist in, in large schools. And this is just a little clip clip of these sand, what it might look like to the humpback whale uh, trying to catch a school of sand lance. Humpback whales uh, have some uh, a wide repertoire of feeding techniques, hunting techniques, uh, and one of the most spectacular is bubble net feeding. Bubble net feeding is not practiced by all the populations of humpback whales. I believe that only two distinct populations bubble net feed, the ones here in the Gulf of Maine and then an Alaskan population that, that use this technique. I suppose there might be other populations that are evolving and starting to use this technique. I really am not sure worldwide, but um, it's not done by all and it is quite spectacular. Uh, a friend of mine, Wayne Davis, is an aerial uh, spotter pilot, took these photographs I'm going to show you. This is the start of the formation of a bubble net. A whale has started here, has located some prey in this area, and has started here deep down and started to emit air out of its blowhole, and it's laying a trap here, uh, a, a closing spiral. I'll take you through a few pictures here. There's a whale in the middle starting to come up into his trap getting closer to the surface. Now it's seen there with its mouth wide open. That's the upper jaw on the baleen. This is that giant bucket, lower jaw, opened wide, hoping to have uh, taken good aim and, and about to collect a, a good mouthful of food. This is uh, from a boat. This is what the bubble net might look like. In that shot, you could see that. Oh, maybe a little more. Sorry. Uh, 
I think these, these shots, one, show you what a bubble net looks like, but also that these whales are uh, cooperatively hunting. Uh, I don't... It, I don't fully understand how many are participating in the creation of the bubble net, but certainly uh, many are taking advantage of it and using it to um, to uh, feed at the same time. Uh, there's a, a, another commonly used feeding technique here in our waters is called lobtail feeding. I, I call it slap feeding. Um, scientists or the literature calls it uh, lobtail feeding whale uses his tail to create a big disturbance in the water and then goes underwater and does a loop, de loop, and then comes back up into that disturbance and feeds. And the birds taking advantage of that as well. Seagulls, different variables, laughing gulls, herring gulls, black back gulls. Just another uh, lobtail feeding sequence. This is. Uh, you want, should, should we try backing or? they fully understand if, if the, it's a shock wave that stuns the prey and then they come and collect it or if the, the disturbance in the water if the bait are hiding in that area of bubbles I, I don't know the answer to that um, be interesting to try to figure out um, just a couple shots here of whales doing their thing up here feeding this one is bursting out of the water um, jaw closed after consuming some prey this shot of the interior of the mouth of a humpback whale with the, the roof structure of the mouth, the baleen here and here, this giant volume of water that it has to get rid of. Uh, they'll come up to the surface and close their mouth and they'll truck along the surface while their chin muscles force that water out through the baleen and uh, clear that water out and swallow their, their food after that. Another feeding shot. You see this quite often. The whale comes to the surface, closes its mouth. As I said, it's now just trucking along the surface trying to expel all that excess water. The seagulls use it as an opportunity to set down and uh, take a break. Um, so with the mother whales that have traveled up from from the tropics to the cooler summer waters bringing their um, their newborn with them probably about six months old uh, leaving the tropics and coming up north uh, the, the juvenile is with the mother typically what we see is the mother will be actively feeding with other whales uh, and the juvenile will be off to the side goofing around doing what kids do and probably primarily still nursing uh, somewhere they say after six months it start to nurse and possibly do some feeding I, we haven't seen any juvenile whales you know newborn first year whales feeding actively with the adult whales here so I'm assuming that they're still uh, nursing but these juvenile whales and mom, mom's off feeding for hours on end the whale is bored and they do some pretty funny things uh, the next slide is one that came up to the boat and gave us a little little show no reason he just swam over to the boat and decided to show us how tough he was and, and sl slung a bunch of water at the boat and swam off again. Uh, we see them rolling around on the surface, flopping their pectoral fins. Sometimes they'll find a piece of seaweed and they'll start playing with it, kill killing time. As I mentioned before, the uh, Provincetown Center for Coastal Studies is out there often studying the whale population. This is one of their vessels, and they are probably out photographing those tail fluke, the underside of the tail fluke, so that they can document which whales have come back again, new, what new whales are arriving, which ones have calves, and so forth. And uh, th this here is a, uh, a hydrophone, which they actually use at times, depending on what kind of whales, to uh, 
lower that into the water and actually listen to the whales and it might help them locate the whales as well. And humpbacks doing what humpbacks do, breaching, they, uh, another thing, I don't think they fully understand why humpbacks breach, but uh, they do it because they can and uh, it's quite spectacular at times and they'll do it over and over again. When you see one usually they'll do, they'll breach three, four, seven times uh, in a row. All right, um, let's see if I've covered everything here. Oh, I didn't touch on their, their, uh, their lifespan. Humpback whales can live anywhere from 45 to 100 years. It's probably really difficult for scientists to get an accurate handle on that. Um, but uh, so the lifespan of 50 years to 100 years. Um, they're only feeding in the summer when they leave these waters and head south, they're basically done feeding. There have been some instances of a rare opportunistic feeding down in the tropical, subtropical waters, but primarily they're fasting all winter um, and living off their fat reserves that they've managed to um, build up over the summer here. And, uh, and, they, and the females are down in the tropics um, uh, calving as well. So uh, one of the best places to observe humpback whales in the water is down in, in uh, Tonga, the kingdom of Tonga. Um, swimming with whales is permitted there. It's, it's heavily regulated um, and permitted, but you you have to uh, be, you have to have a permit to, and go with a licensed and authorized uh, outfitter. Um, but it is one of the best places to see them. The water is clear and blue there. The uh, whales are there in good numbers. Um, so I had to travel to Tonga to go swim with them, and it is very far away. Um, just to give you a sense, uh, I had to fly from Boston to LA, and then from LA, 11, 12 hour flight across the Pacific, past Hawaii, initially landing. This map's gonna take you right, right to Tonga, but I had to go to Fiji first, which was over here. Here's Tonga. Fiji was over here, so I flew from LA to Fiji. Fiji, got on a smaller plane, flew to Tonga, once I was in the main island of Tonga, I had to get on another smaller plane and fly all the way up to Vavau up here where, where I did that whale watching. Give you a little better sense of where Tonga is. This is New Zealand down here. Tonga is here. This is Samoa, Fiji. So uh, it's, it's pretty remote. And, and briefly Tonga, uh, the main island, Tonga Tapu. Uh, consists of 177 islands, the Kingdom of Tonga, uh, three major island groups, Tonga Tapu, Hapai, and Vavau. Uh, and as I said, this is, Vavau was the island group that I uh, visited. Had a little welcoming committee, uh, some Tongan schoolgirls doing a project at the airport. Uh, once I got to the, uh, Vavau, um, I had to take a boat to another island to get to where I stayed for eight days. In, in this little bungalow up here. And uh, this is the view from the bungalow. The striking thing about this is the color of the water in Tonga. I, it's indescribably blue, um, electric blue. It's another shot of that, that water, which is uh, like nothing I've ever seen before. Um, there's some, some, some native Tongan pigs at the beach, uh, in low tide foraging gives new meaning to salt pork. Uh, here's uh, just a little scenery shot. And here is the boat that we um, were on for, well, during the day, on for or eight days. Um, this is our, our, our team. We had the, uh, the Chinese contingency over here, Japanese contingency over here. This is Tony Wu, our uh, guide, and this is a Tongan um, boat operator uh, mate on the boat. And uh, finally in the water in Tonga, um, this, this was Tony who clearly is faster than I am at uh, swimming underwater. Um, this is a mother with a first year calf here um, swimming together. This, this is a much younger calf. That calf in the previous shot was probably a month or two old. This is several weeks old. You can see the skin is very 
soft and, and, and smooth here. Also a very short jawline here. If you look at the mother, the eye is kind of hard to find on, on whales, but the eye is right here. Um, same with on the juvenile right here. But in proportion, the mother's jawline is, is quite long. The juvenile, the younger they are, the shorter their, their jaw is. So that's a, a couple of weeks old. Another shot. Now this is uh, a third whale here, which they call an escort. This is a male that has, for some reason, decided to hang out with these two and follow them around, probably in the hopes of uh, getting lucky, um, uh, or 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 just uh, acting parental, perhaps. Um, I don't think they fully understand, but they call them an escort. Uh, seeing seeing a, a mother and calf together is really amazing. The the contact, the bond between the two, um, very typical, uh, uh, really neat. Again, the coming together. Now this is a juvenile, probably a, a, a month old, um, and breaching for for unknown reasons. This is a, a, the same juvenile breaching again. Mom had just breached back here, leaving this huge crater. Um, so Junior is probably copying Mom. Same thing, flopping over. So they breach in all different directions. This is pretty neat. This is mom coming out here like an intercontinental ballistic missile and uh, junior a little more half-hearted uh, jump. All right, this little video of uh, the, uh, what will happen is the mother is, is down 50 feet down, basically sleeping, half sleeping. They're, in a, they're fasting all um, winter. So living off their fat reserves, they're not doing much. They're just hanging out. Um, and this is Junior. You'll see uh, Junior come up and uh, while mom just lounges around. Also, the mother can hold its breath for much longer. So the juvenile has to come up and uh, breathe much more frequently, probably every six, seven minutes. The mother can hold its breath for half an hour or more. Playful. Unusual, it opened its mouth. You don't see that too often. And then now it's done playing. It's maybe got hungry again and heading back down to mom. And so it's probably going to nurse uh, as it, when it goes down. It, it hangs out and uh, appears to be nursing, although if you're not down there, you don't know exactly what's going on. This was somewhat of an accidental picture. Um, I'd been following Tony, chasing some whales off in the distance, and he stopped when he found this. This is actually whale milk. The uh, juvenile either burped or some just escaped, and uh, this was an accidental picture. It wasn't planned this way. Um, but this whale milk, I mean, the whale's long gone. This stuff is still um, all stringy. It's 50% fat, the whale milk of a, of a humpback whale, so incredibly rich. Uh, sequence of uh, the mother, uh, a mother humpback breaching. Uh, how they're able to do this, I can't imagine. They, uh, they don't need deep water to do this. They don't do it with a lot of speed. I guess it's just the momentum of such a giant creature. Just keep once it's going in a direction, it keeps going, and it, uh, the display they put on is breathtaking. Um, this shot is a, a juvenile, and the reason I put it up here is this right here. This is a someone has taken a scoop out of this whale, uh, and that would be a cookie cutter shark. Uh, this is the same whale a couple days earlier that it was right right there and so this this is that's a that's a fresh bite right there done by this 
creature, this nasty creature called a cookie cutter shark. It's about two or three feet long. This shark during the day is down 10,000 feet deep. And at night, it travels two miles back up to the surface and um, uses these lips to suction on to its prey, typically whales, dolphin, um, sometimes fish, and then these bizarre jaws to actually take a scoop right out of uh, whatever unlucky um, creature it happens to find. Uh, just a couple of uh, beauty shots of uh, the, these these incredible animals and swimming with them is just unbelievable to be in the water with them and this particular whale um, our guide nicknamed Rambo it it thought that we were play toys and it would come around and chase us uh, uh, one woman actually got slapped in the face with the tail because she didn't realize she needed to move um, after that she started swimming a little faster um, but this particular um, juvenile was really rambunctious and uh, literally chased us around uh, in, a, in a pretty gentle way, not viciously at all, but it, it, it made you swim fast and get out of its way. I'll show you some video of that as well. can see the uh, those those pleats in its throat here extending even possibly further than half of the length of the whale so this whole area here when it's feeding up in the, in either the north or the, in this case a Tongan whale would be down in Antarctica this whole area would be its its chin puffed out as it gulps water and fish hopefully all right this should be a video come within, within feet of us. Um, it was really remarkable. A neat shot, just having fun. As it approached, I'd start to move because you, you just don't want to wait around uh, until it's too late. So uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of swimming going on. And I'm using a very wide angle lens, so that looks somewhat distant, but it's no more than five feet from me. It was kind of like full, full contact uh, whale swimming because the whale wanted it to be that way. This is just, just the juvenile, this is not the mother. The mother's sleeping. going off. See, just as just as it's about to get to the surface, it'll start to exhale, so that it's ready to inhale as it hits the surface. Young whale doing, having fun. 
These are all shots of, of juveniles. And then there's mom. That's it. Thanks very much, Eric. Fantastic. I uh, would like to open the floor to any questions in the audience. Has anybody digested enough to be able to ask a, a question or two? Just raise your hand. Back here, sir. Yes, and please hold the mic like this in front of your mouth. Hi, Eric. Um, I've actually got a bunch. Great. When, when it feeds, like any filter, it's probably going to get food caught in the baleen. How does it express it out of there? Ton? Uh, I, I would assume, I don't know that answer, but I would assume it, it sort of can backwash. It, it, it just shake its head and get some circulation through there. Uh, I, I can't imagine. I don't know if they need uh, dental cleaning or not, but it's uh, <laughs> a good question. Um, if we're getting warmer water, do you see any evidence that they're migrating further north? Uh, I'm, I'm not a biologist, marine biologist, um, and haven't been studying those kind of details. Uh, I would assume that uh, if, if that trend has started, it's, it's probably very gradual, and, and I don't know if it's been documented yet, but I'm sure that's where things are, are headed. There's definitely going to be a shift in, in where the food is and therefore where the whales are. And finally, kind of a personal uh, travel question. I was standing on the shore in Simonstown, South Africa, and there were whales out there, and I didn't know what they were. Um, there were whales. And by the way, it looked like they were getting lucky. <laughs> yeah, that's another, uh, another hot spot. I, I assume that's the, near the southern tip of South Africa. It's a, a hot spot for, for diff all different species of whales there. The uh, clip you showed of the singing, there did not seem to be any air expelled from the whale at that point? They are, they're, um, because they, uh, another point I'll raise in a minute, uh, they, they're not, um, they're not actually singing, they don't have vocal cords, they're, they're moving air within their nasal passages, but not emitting any of that. It's just moving it perhaps back and forth, creating the sounds that they're able to create. Um, I should point out, I failed to mention that the Unlike ourselves, where we can breathe through our mouth or our nose, whales and marine mammals only breathe through their nostrils, their mouth strictly for feeding. Don't baleen whales have tongues? And how does this figure into their feeding? Are they uh, licking, are they licking the krill? I assume they have tongues. As I said, I'm not, I'm not a marine biologist. I don't know for sure. Uh, you don't see the, any tongue in, in the feeding that, that I've observed. I've never seen. I, I'm sure they have something, but I, I think it probably is much smaller and, and further back in their, in their mouth and, and serves different purposes. than. I don't think they use that as actively as part of their feeding repertoire. Uh, the singing of the uh, males, does this occur in a particular season, or is it all year round? That's a good question. Uh, the, the singing happens in their winter, during that fasting period, uh, either pre-mating or perhaps during the whole winter season as a male communication. Um, they typically don't sing when they're uh, in their summer cold, cooler water. They do make sounds. They probably use sounds for hunting uh, during the summer months, but it's not the same purpose as the singing, which goes on in the winter. Did you see any signs of the mother being protective of the juvenile? Another good question. Um, Yes, there were definitely uh, our, our guide, the, the trip leader, Tony Wu, um, it was very observant of, and he's been, he's been going to Tonga for 14 seasons. I think this was his 15th season going there to swim with the humpback whales, and uh, very observant of the body language of the mother, 
um, getting in the water and not doing a whole lot at first, seeing how the mother reacts. Uh, sometimes mother and, and baby would swim off, and uh, mother, some mothers were not comfortable with people being around as, uh, the, you know, the one particular juvenile I did a lot of, most of the footage of that juvenile whale nicknamed Rambo, the mother could care less that we were there. Um, she was just sleeping and having to feed the, the darn guy constantly. Um, so it really depends on the mother, probably on how old the, the, the baby is. If it's really, really young, probably they're more protective. The um, there were pock lo like pock marks on the on the bodies of the whales. Was that also from those sharks? That's a great question, and I actually meant to say that in some of the slides following the cookie cutter slide. There's, there's all these scars that are almost assuredly uh, previous bites, which evidently heal up really quickly. Um, you know, there's a blubber layer on these whales, even the juveniles. So that's really just taking out of the very surface uh, of the whale. But yeah, they're covered in in bites from these uh, cookie cutter sharks. Any further questions? I didn't really understand that bubble feeding. What do they accomplish by those bubbles? Do they shake up the fish from the bottom? Do they move them to the center? That's a great question. Uh, uh, as I understand it, it's, it's, it's basically corralling the fish. They find the fish primarily probably through um, echolocation underwater their eyesight, they don't use eyesight like we do. Eyesight is a, a fourth, fifth, sixth sense that they don't use a lot. They really, your visibility, particular in the northern cool water, is not clear. Not like Tonga, where the water is fairly clear. But up here, you can't see more than 10, 15 feet. So they're using their eyes minimally and using their other senses to locate prey. Once they locate prey, they use that bubble net as a, as a, as a net, as a trap, to encircle the prey, create a curtain of bubbles, that basically a column that, that holds that bit, that all those little fish inside this column, and then they swim up from the bottom and uh, mouth open. And when they get to the surface, they've driven that, all that bait's trying to get away. They don't go this way because they see the bubbles and they're scared of that. And they come up, and when the surface is the end of the road for them, and that's where the whales meet them and eat them. So this must happen quite often during the day, this type of feeding. So it's, it's, it's not like two, three times a day. It could be a hundred times or more. Yeah, if you go out on a whale watch off of Chatham, which is sort of the hot spot around here, um, you'll see some, you know, some days you don't see any bubble net feeding. You'll see some uh, lobtail feeding. Yeah. But if they're bubble net feeding, it'll be going on all day, all over the place. On a good day when you're out there, you see whales and all, humpback whales in all directions. Mm -hmm. Some minke whales mixed in, maybe sometimes fin whales mixed in and porpoise. But uh, it's, it's all day long, all summer. And they typically have just one calf, right? And it would be yes, once uh, a year? Is uh, it? Uh, that's a great question. I've got it on my list here that I missed. Uh, that... Um, well, the uh, females reach sexual maturity at age five. They're not fully grown yet, so they can start having calves at age five. And um, there's a uh, 11 and a half month gestation period, which times very nicely with summer and winter. It's a 12 month cycle. So they, they uh, uh, mate and give birth in the winter in the warm, nice water and come back again to do the same a year later. They give birth a year later back in that nice, warm water. So if they live till they're 80 years old, they might be able to have calves for several years. They typically produce many, many calves over their life cycle. Not okay. every year, I think two to three years, uh, each two to three years, sometimes probably a little more frequent, but uh, um, they probably, uh, something that the Providence Coastal Center knows, and I don't have the exact answer, but they're able to see the same mother returning because they can identify it from that tail fluke and that that thumbprint and see that um, with another juvenile, another first year born, and then a couple years, another one, they know how many calves that particular mother's actually had. Yeah. And that calf needs to memorize its mother's tail as well, right? Yeah, it's a t tail or a, it's just one of those, there's innate knowledge of who mom is. A couple more here. I'm going to ask, how deep do they dive? 
Well, the humpback whales, I, I, I don't have an exact answer. They don't need to dive very deep. They're typically feeding in, at least in here, the deepest water we see them feeding in. You might, you might be in as much as 400 feet of water, but they're not feeding at the bottom. They might be feeding at the bottom sometimes. You see most of the feeding happening at the surface. Um, they're not a, the humpback is not a deep diving whale. The, the sperm whale, which live on squid, dive down to upwards of 10,000 feet, maybe more, um, and use massive sonar equipment in their nose to find these squid down there. But the humpbacks are, are more in the top 100 feet is mostly where they're feeding, sometimes near the bottom. If all the bait that they feed on is near the bottom and two, 300 feet, they might be down there feeding as well. So that's like the normal range? Yep. And then what about like other species, killer whales? Uh, killer whales typically are uh, uh, hunting larger prey, so near the surface seals or, or um, porpoise and, and other things. I'm, I don't have total knowledge of, of their feeding habits, but uh, they're not a deep water species. I'm trying to think of what other deep water whales. Uh, some, there's a whole class of whales called beaked whales, which are similar to, to sperm whales, but much smaller, um, that are deep squid-eating whales. There's Rizzo's dolphin. Some of the dolphin feed really deep as well. And they're not like rivals they're for not. space or territory, like killer whales, humpback whales? I'm sure there's some some sparring I, I, as far as... Uh, but they still, you don't see you don't see any contact actually here during the feeding season. They're all feeding and going about their business. Sometimes in groups of up to six or eight, and sometimes single whales. Uh, but you never see any conflict going on. All right, one more question. I saw a hand back here. Here, sir. Hey, Eric. From a photography perspective, do you just go down with one rig and shoot video and stills, or do you go down with multiple rigs? And are you snorkeling, or are you with scuba gear? Great, great questions. Um, in Tonga, I don't believe you're allowed to use scuba gear, um, so snorkeling, and uh, almost everything that I do is snorkeling. Uh, surprisingly, I, I use scuba very little. Um, certain places where there's uh, different things, sharks that go to cleaning stations, uh, I might be, uh, that might be a trip where I'm on scuba the whole time. As far as the camera gear, sort of evolved from eight years, ten years ago, using a, a borrowed point and shoot from my friend Art, who's here, uh, and and probably ruining it uh, in a little plastic housing to a, a little better camera each year. Um, shooting started out; shoot, it was a stills camera shooting video ten years ago. Then I completely got into video and purchased a video camera with a housing and was shooting video for the past maybe five years. Um, but it was very big, and the DSLR single lens reflex cameras started to take good video, um, as good at, most of the time as, as the video cameras. So I transitioned into a um, DSLR that shoots video for two reasons. One, I already had one of those bodies, and now I have a second body, so I have a backup. If I'm on a trip to Tonga and my camera breaks, it would be pretty disappointing to come home with no uh, underwater imagery. So um, for that reason, I bought a second DSLR that's slightly better, but in the same body. And uh, so I shoot, and then I actually became an underwater photographer once I had the DSLR. Uh, and so now I'm balancing video and photo, which is said not to be a, a good thing to do to take both video and stills. You're supposed to do, you do neither of them well instead of focusing on one. But uh, that's my nature is to be a jack of all trades. Well, I think uh, on behalf of everyone here, uh, I can thank you, Eric, and say I foresee perhaps some more presentations like this in the future. So thanks Sounds very much. Great. Help me thank Eric. Thank you all for coming.